Saddle up, strap in, and prepare yourself for the twists and turns, the highs and lows, the true roller coaster that is Darksiders 3. A masterful disappointment. A game that is static and miserable at the same time. A game willing to change up the formula, to take the leap of faith. But did it work out? That's for you to decide. Will you be rushing off to replay this game? Or wondering why anyone would bother playing a game like this at all? A game destined to fall short of its predecessors. But did it really fall at all? Why did the creator construct a universe teeming with imperfection, misery, sin? Among the scholars of both heaven and hell, this query is known as the Riddle of Sorrows. If sin is itself a part of the grand design, is not sin then, by definition, divine? A question for the sages. The one particularly restless bunch kept a robust relationship to the topic. The Nephilim. Spawn of angels and demons. Warriors, relentless, unstoppable, blood mad. Until they were betrayed by four of their own. War, death, fury, and strife. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. Inconceivable power was bestowed upon the traitors by those sworn to maintain symmetry, twixt order and chaos. The Charred Council. Bear witness as the Council holds court to end the Nephilim War in the name of balance. This is the new pact. War, bringer of worldwide fire. You are the juggernaut of all pain. Death, dark soul of eternity. You are the deepest decay. You are anti-life. Strife, endless spirit of timeless unrest. You are all that is unsettled in the hearts of that which lives and breathes. And finally, fury. Terrible engine of rage. You are the machine that- Are we to waste our time on ceremony or are we to fight? Step forward and recognize, horseman. You are the most impatient of your kin. The least predictable, dancing on the edge of your own reality. Your brothers understand the undertaking set before them. But do you? Still talking! Shall I have Death fetch us some tea, or can we get on with it? Fury, your role in this story is yet to be written. I wonder. Will you light the flame of creation anew? Or stomp out the embers for good? Fury. This isn't war, this isn't death, that's for sure. A new game, a new horseman, a deviant, an outlier amongst the four. The intro alone speaks plenty for the type of horseman Fury is. The name alone is a dead giveaway, but in case you missed it, the intro does not shy away from making sure you know as a player the type of protagonist Fury is. Not once has a horseman spoken to the Charred Council in such a manner. Where all other horsemen bow their heads, Fury stands tall, foreshadowing events to come. All you need to know about Fury is given to us in this open sequence. She even goes as far as making a demand from the Council in return for her killing all of the seven deadly sins. I demand that you grant me my rightful place leading the horsemen. If you would trade obedience for a title, so be it. But never make a demand upon us, horsemen. And as someone who's played the previous games, this felt fulfilling. Before this, the Chard Council was seen as these divine godlike entities, untouchable beings, that's words became commandment. Fury is as expected, the embodiment of her title, passion, rage, and savagery. From the second we land on Earth, 
we know what we're in for. The cheeky grin. The feeling of absolute badassery. It's in the beginning, where we get our first taste. Something's a little off. This isn't the arcadey combat we're used to from Darksiders 1 and 2. This, this is something more challenging. More time orientated. Dare I say, more soulsy? Yes, one of the biggest complaints about this game was that the combat was more attuned to a Souls-like than the previous button mashing, kill frenzy games that were Darksiders 1 and 2, even with the traditional combat mode turned on. Now, instead of just spamming the dodge button, you've actually got to time it. Who would have thought that such a small change would have made so many people upset? They changed the formula. No, they added a level of skill that was missing from previous games. Now instead of spamming buttons to clear a room full of enemies, you have to wait, pick your moments to attack and fall back. I think it's great they added some thought into the game, but that's it. That's as far as we get. There isn't anything we haven't seen here. We've had time dodges and blocks in games like Assassin's Creed or Nier Automata. This isn't something exclusive or new, and that's where the disappointment is for me. It's similar to games like Jedi Fallen Order, where it has the formula of a Souls game, but it doesn't have the soul of the Dark Souls games. For me at least, it was the setting, the try and try again mentality that was the soul in the Dark Souls series. So when you take away this frustrating, yet rewarding and challenging combat to master out of the Dark Souls universe, it really does start to suffer. It's like finding a clam with a pearl inside and just taking the clam. It's stupid. What's the fucking point? Why on earth did my fun arcade combat game, where I didn't really have to think about doing anything, go from this to this bullshit? Now don't get me wrong, I actually enjoyed the combat in Darksiders 3, but the thing is, I can sympathise with players and fans of the series who miss the older stuff. It was simply fun. You didn't have to think too hard, you could sit back and relax. And if you wanted more of a challenge, you simply turned the difficulty up. Which ties me to my next point. Why on earth is there a difficulty setting for this game? I mean honestly, all that changes is the values. You take more damage, the enemy have more health. Nothing else changes, except if you decide to play on The Reckoning. It reduces the dodge time window, which is fantastic. But what I'm trying to point out here is the lack of depth in the system. Having a story difficulty in any game is mandatory these days. Some people don't want to be challenged, at all, and that's fine. But when you have three useless difficulties before Reckoning, that only serve to change the amount of times you have to hit enemies or reduce the number of hits that you can take before dying? Is there really a point? It's not like these difficulties up the number of enemies in the world. It's just a missed opportunity to provide players with more meaningful experiences through more diverse difficulties. But in saying that, they have a very cool feature, stolen from other games of course. Can you guess it? Yup, they stole the concept of hardcore runs. Darksiders 3 now has a hardcore mode called Nightmare. If you die, your save file is deleted. Which is a nice concept, especially for those few that really want to push themselves. But that's it. That's the thing. There are so many random bullshit things that can happen in this game which can kill you. It's a huge risk. You can easily die to the things that weren't avoidable. But maybe that's because I myself have never been interested in hardcore mechanics such as this. So if this sounds like something up your alley, feel free to go for it. Darksiders 3 has no stamina. There is no block or parry, but it does have a dodge, and a pretty cool one at that. When you land a perfectly timed dodge, your next attack becomes empowered with ridiculous damage and a badass animation. That in of itself is so satisfying, I think I might have an addiction. I mean, check these out.
fucking incredible. But it came at a cost. The executions. Like my friends, the executions are missing. Non-existent from this game. Something that was somewhat of a fan favourite in previous games. Gone. Quicker than my hopes and dreams once I realised Santa wasn't real. It baffles me that this was one of the sacrifices. So you're telling me that they couldn't think of any cool executions to do with a whip. Because I can think of one. And it's called tying a noose for whatever guy decided to remove this from the game. Okay look, I don't actually mean that, but like, why? Why gunfire games? Why remove such a fun feature? Especially because it not only serves and is an extremely satisfying feature, but also a way to take a short break among the madness. The executions may have been brief, at least for a small enemy, but the larger ones took a little while, which allowed the player to cool off. You just busted your nut trying to fight a room full of goons, and believe me, getting even a short second rest to think is extremely nice. And for those that argue that executions get dull and repetitive, I have this to say to you. Don't fucking do them. They're optional. They have a big red icon above their head. If you don't want to execute, just hit them one more time to kill them. It's really not hard. I think I slightly derailed there, but executions are important and it's a shame they're not in this game. So what next? What else does this game's combat have to offer? Well, the game keeps its Wrath and Havoc abilities from the older games, but there must be something new, right? Correct. Introducing different hollows or forms, all passed on to you by the Lord of Hollows. Each of these provides some diverse and different weapons to use, apart from Fury's main whip. Each hollow has its own gimmick. The Flame Hollow has both the Chains of Talon and Scorn, which are nunchucks and glaives. Both prime for attacking enemies quickly, they both have low damage but hit fast. And as the Flame Hollow name suggests, if you land a perfectly timed dodge or activate your wrath attack, you use a fury of attacks and set your enemy ablaze, dealing damage over time. The perfect weapon against enemies you're struggling to find a window of opportunity to attack in. The next is the Force Hollow, which has a great axe or a great mallet, both slow moving and heavy hitting. If I'm being honest, this has the least diversity between the two weapons, but for the most part, they feel the same. They are great at dealing with large groups of enemies, or a large boss that doesn't attack quickly. But the Wrath ability is where the Force Hollow shines. It sucks enemies in towards the player and releases a Force Push, dealing damage and knocking enemies back. Next up is the Stasis Hollow that has both a sword and a scythe. Both handle pretty much the same as the middle ground between slow and fast, weak and hard hitting, short and long ranged. Their balance between all these weapons makes them ideal for new encounters that you're unfamiliar with, especially with the Wrath ability that turns you invincible for a period of time, and every enemy that hits you in this period of time is slowed for a brief second. There is a catch of course, for every time you get hit, the invincibility duration is reduced, it's a solid class and probably my favourite, simply because the animations are mesmerising. Last up is the Lance and Polearm. I don't really know how to say it, but I'm going to go with that. There are basically both spears of the Storm Hollow. The Polearm is a double-ended spear that is great for AoE damage, but again, doesn't have high damage because of how quick it can be used. While the Lance, on the other hand, attacks quickly and can reach a little further away than other weapons and pulling off a perfectly timed dodge means you can throw the lance at an enemy, making it a fantastic way for dealing with ranged enemies. This is where the depth of the combat starts to shine. Your ability to swap between forms and weapons mid-fight allows for some truly sensational skill expression. Can you dodge a ranged attack and immediately change to a storm hollow to throw a lance at a ranged enemy off in the distance? Then transform back to the force hollow to fight the cluster of enemies right on top of you. True mastery of the combat system comes from mastery of each hollow, each element, knowing what they're good against and when to swap between them, which wrath abilities to use and when. Darksiders 3's combat system is by no means shallow, and it's probably one of the best in the franchise, if not one of the best in modern games. The potential isn't limitless, but its skill ceiling is high and it most certainly gives you the platform to reach for those heights. I might be overselling it, but for the most part, there is a lot of potential here. I mean, don't be fooled by the button mashing attack system, there is true mastery to be had here. 
its simplistic nature makes it easy to approach for just about anyone of any skill level, yet its combo system and diverse elements switching system between your hollows for some true combat depth most certainly rewards those daring enough to try and master it. Let's get into some of the RPG elements, like gear and leveling. Did I ever tell you how fantastic Darksiders 2's gear and progression was? Did I ever tell you how simple and masterful the system was? Did I ever tell you how easy it was to create complex builds yet feel rewarding for doing so? Everything was straightforward while still having tremendous depth. It was hands down the greatest implementation I've seen of RPG elements to date. There was legendary gear that came with crazy effects to upgradable gear that changed the stats based on the items that you fed it to level it up. Collectible crystals out in the world that improved certain stats when combined together. Gear sets that dramatically affected your playstyle. These are just some of the elements that made Darksiders 2's incredible character progression system so great. So where the fuck did it all go? To say that they under-delivered here would be the understatement of the century. If you played the base game, you have a total of 6 weapons. The game does then give you access to 4 more weapons for each hollow if and only if you decide to buy one of the DLCs for this game. I mean, come on, really? Six weapons in a game that goes for 20 hours? If you don't count DLC? It's a joke! And for no other reason than the developers couldn't be bothered designing more weapons for you to use. My biggest issue is that these weapons are all tied to their specific hollows. For instance, if you want to use the Lance, you have to use the Storm Hollow. Why not allow the player to use different weapons with different hollows? I mean, how cool would it be to throw a flaming lance at an enemy across the map? Or use a heavy axe with the stasis hollow, slowing enemies and allowing you to get your full heavy combo off. It's just a missed opportunity to create an even more diverse system. There was, however, one pretty interesting change, and that was the way you now level up in this game. Rather than having your standard EXP bar, you instead have souls that are collected from enemies and collectibles. You can then turn these souls into Volgrim in order to level up Fury. Leveling up then gives you a choice of three stats. Leveling up Health, Strength or Arcane. However, these same souls are also used to buy items and equipment from Volgrim, so it comes with a balancing act of deciding to either level up or buy necessary consumables or items that help you through the story. This by no means is an original idea, but it does get you to think, and that's what role-playing systems should do. They should get you to think about the consequences and trade-offs of how you spend your souls rather than have systems like Assassin's Creed where you inevitably unlock all the skills so it becomes a game of deciding which ones you want first. They did a fantastic job here, but that's where my praises for this game's role-playing mechanics end. Because the way the weapons and gear are upgraded in this game, it's dull and forgettable. Each weapon has an enhancement slot, which can obviously be filled with an enhancement. Some good, some bad. The fact that you have to find them out in the world and probably won't have access to any useful ones until late in the game does make the system pretty redundant. But that's the thing. They're all just stat boosts. Just like how weapons and armor upgrades work in this game, it's just numbers. There is no effects that dramatically change playstyle or how a fight would play out. It's crazy how they have most of these effects from previous games and could have easily implemented them. Like a stasis enhancement that has a chance to freeze a target solid. Or Storm Hollow one, where attacks have a chance to bounce to nearby enemies, zapping them for some damage. Never once have I felt so disappointed as to when I realized just how shallow this system was. It was shocking to say the least. So much so that it honestly angers me just thinking about it. It's funny how the bare minimum of replicating the system from Darksiders 2 would have been enough. I would have been satisfied with an identical copy of Darksiders 2's role-playing mechanics. Yet, we're left with a system that is lackluster and dull, and doesn't hold a candle to what came before it. It's just a bundle of missed opportunities, because they chose not to implement any functions that they had already made in previous games. And for a lack of a better segue, let's talk about another thing that disappoints me about this game. 
the puzzles. I'll keep this brief, because the truth is, this game does little to offer you any food for thought. There is a total of like three puzzles, so forgettable, I'm struggling to remember what those three were. For the most part, they took the Metroidvania approach, where you unlock new hollows and they allow you to unlock new areas in the world through traversal or door opening options. Their use in the puzzles is fairly straightforward because there is usually one path you can take when completing a puzzle in this game. It's like the developers forgot to take the training wheels off. It's designed in a manner where the answer is always presented in front of you, and you don't have to think at all. It doesn't have any dungeons full of puzzles like Darksiders 2 had. No fun and interesting mechanics like Darksiders 2 either. I'd go as far as saying this game has no puzzles at all. If you wanted to play this game because of the puzzles, I'd strongly recommend against doing so, because in all honesty, it doesn't compare to Darksiders 2. Not even close. I hate comparing this game to Darksiders 2 so much, but I can't not. It was such a fantastic game, and to see so many features of the game being cut from Darksiders 3, I can't help but shed a tear about what this game truly could have been. Whether it was intended or not, Fury feels weak. She isn't death or war. You don't get the sense of unprecedented power from the name alone. I know when I picture the word Fury, it's some mad kid screaming over the most scuffed mic about how he plans to do my mum later tonight. I mean, when you hear war and death, I can tell you right now, you won't picture something as amusing. Fury's name does little to kindle the fire, and where death slayed the crow father, in the opening act, all Fury has is a rather easy fight against Envy. Whether the developers intended it or not, Fury doesn't feel powerful like her brothers. This is where the mood is set. You realize the mountain of a task ahead of you. You may have slain one of the seven deadly sins, but as the Watcher says, Envy was also by far the weakest of the deadly sins. Not to mention the sheer scale of the Maker's Tree. You feel well out of your depth. The world's size and stature are a metaphor for just how large of a task you have ahead of you. I mean, they use the same technique in Darksiders 2 with the Forge Lands. And did it work? It most certainly did. The mood is set exceptionally well in this game. We are playing as the short-tempered, feisty fury, not willing to bow to anyone. Yet we feel the weight of the task ahead of us. We feel that despite playing one of the horsemen, we're still vulnerable, even just a little bit. And that's the beauty of it. You're a single horseman sent to the task that previously required all four, on a world that is destroyed and ravaged by war. It really does seem like a strenuous task. But because of who Fury is, her actions towards the Chard Council, we know she's the right horseman for the job, that she is capable on her own. Darksiders 3 is a story of character, a story of setbacks, difficulties, and determination to overcome what is seen as an arduous task. But what's the point of this? It's to make an emotional connection to the player. You'll either like or dislike Fury, but either way, there's a connection. And this connection makes you as a player more invested in the story, more invested in the characters. It becomes a journey of character development well worth playing through. Humans, frail as they be, are part of the balance. Surely you're here to help protect them. <sighs> Wrong question. <laughs> A tribe of useless, hairless simians whose greatest talent was inventing ingenious new ways to divide and destroy one another. They could suffer forever or die tomorrow, and I wouldn't bat an eye either way. I'd be lying if I didn't say I disliked Fury in the beginning, especially given her attitudes towards humans. But seeing her evolve and change is a journey in of itself. She's not perfect, but she is admirable. Admirable for her pride, her attitude of not giving a shit, whether it be child counsel or a maker. Her growth throughout the story pays off in the end. When we see her make a sacrifice to protect the human race, she understands the significance, the reason, the duty that she must take up in order to protect the balance of the universe. It feels satisfying to see Fury in all her glory, to see her prosper in the end. 
it makes playing through the entire game worthwhile. I love everything about the story of this game. How it's done, how the big finale plays off. Without spoiling anything, I most certainly didn't expect it, and I could probably say that just about nobody did. Darksiders 3 is a journey, a game with many ups and downs, a game that undesirably stands in the shadow of its brother, Darksiders 2. But Darksiders 3 is a fantastic game with fantastic combat systems, with enormous potential for mastery, as you swap in and out of hollows, as you face off against different enemies, a weapon and armor set that leaves much to be desired. The removal of features, prominent, so well designed from Darksiders 2, leaves you to wonder just how good this game could have been with their implementation. A story of growth and overcoming a boundless task, Fury makes the trip up the mountain worthwhile. I love just how well this game's combat, progression and story tie themselves together. I'd really like to tell you that this game is as good if not better than Darksiders 2. But the thing is, they're completely different games. So much so that comparing them as a whole does neither of them justice. Sure, I can compare certain mechanics, but the truth is, both of them have their problems. Darksiders 3 is not the perfect game, but it is most certainly a game worthy of your time. I strongly believe that if this game interests you at all, you should go out and get it. Thanks for watching, I know it was a long one, but I'd appreciate it if you could leave a like and subscribe as well as let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below. If you'd like to see more Darksiders content, or even just other games you'd like me to review, also feel free to let me know in the comments section below. Like always, thanks for watching.